Hello, this is Vicki Malta, and this is you and your mental wellness. Uh, tonight, we have a theme that we're going to generally cover c about kindness. And of course, everybody knows that kindness is important and affects everybody. It's very important for people to be able to um, feel accepted and understood by other people. and. But tonight I'm focusing on kindness as the fountainhead of recovery because this show has to do, do with um, mental health and, and mental wellness and recovery. And the way that people can recover better is when people treat them with kindness because it helps them to feel like uh, they're growing into their own potential. And um, it's just overall to feel a connection with other people that's very important for people who are in recovery from mental illness because so many people feel so isolated and need to feel that they have potential and are accepted by other people. So um, tonight I have a guest, his name is Brian Rainier and he's a human services advocate and client rights officer at a local mental health authority in Middletown, which is, has an agency of 600 people. And if you could just talk to me a little bit about your agency and, and what you do there, because I'm not really sure, and the name too, I'm not really sure exactly um, if you want to tell people more. Sure, I'm glad to be here with you. Um, I've been enjoyed our preparations for this and our discussions and I'm happy to be on your show. Thanks. River Valley Services is the agency that I work at, and uh, it's, it is in Middletown. It's called the Local Mental Health Authority. And as such, it um, is the leader, if you will, of a number of nonprofit agencies that um, are affiliated with it. They're known as affiliates. And they provide mental health services of all kinds uh, to uh, people with mental illnesses who don't have uh, their own insurance and who are basically poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they have case management services and a homeless outreach team and a mobile crisis unit, uh, <clears throat> a uh, transitional treatment and evaluation unit that is used to um, evaluate people before they come into the system. Uh, they have case management, uh, a couple of teams of case management. They have thera provide therapy for folks, and uh, again, it's outpatient. So that's in general uh, what we do there. Mm -hmm. And so what you do as a um, human services advocate and client rights officer, you, you said that you handle grievances and complaints? Right, and yeah. Yeah, you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a, the client's rights officer. Um, I do handle grievances and complaints from the clients who we serve when they have um, disagreements or complaints about the staff that are there to serve them. Mm -hmm. And so I try to mediate uh, solutions between the staff and the clients. And, and as a client advocate, uh, I try to just be a helper Mm -hmm. in any way I can. I have a background in counseling, but beyond that, I have a background in mental illness. I myself have a mental illness, as you well know. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you do and many others, I uh, use those experiences to, to try to help people along and instill hope in them. Right, that's great. That's, um, so you have both the educational background with the master's in counseling, plus you have um, first-hand experience as a person with, with mental illness that gives you um, a, a certain um, special understanding and empathy toward people with mental illness that people who don't have that don't really have an understanding. And right. so I wanted to know, um, I wanted to know, you've come such a long way. How, how long have you been working at River Valley? I've been working there 14 years. That's great. So, um, because you had come from a really um, different place, you know, maybe 
20, 30 years ago. And um, do you feel that people along the way who have been kind to you have helped you to grow into the person that you, you've come, become today? No question. I wish there were more kind people in the world, and I, I wish there were more kind people who worked in the mental health field. I mean, we have some kind people, no doubt. Um, but uh, there was a lot of waiting uh, mm -hmm. in my growth and my recovery um, and painstaking waiting, uh, long suffering, uh, trying to um, move up out of my condition, which was pretty bad um, back then. And uh, I didn't see a way out, but uh, there were a few key people uh, who really helped me out a great deal. Um, one person, Brian Gibbons, I'll mention, who, who was serving as a therapist for me, and I was so forlorn and down and hopeless uh, that I was not making any progress. And Brian had a vision for me. He held up a vision for me when I couldn't have one for myself. And um, it was a vision that said, basically, uh, I see you as someone who's going to work in the mental health field someday and make strong impact on people in your work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe him, but he called his wife into the room and he asked her if she had the same vision of me. And she said, absolutely. So there were two people there who believed in me and I decided to give it a try, to try to believe in that vision. So not only were they kind to you, but they, they saw potential in you and they, and they offered you hope, you know, hope that um, you could grow into someone even greater than you could ever have imagined. Yes, you know, absolutely. And, um, I remember you said that, <clears throat> just going back for a minute about your um, past experiences of your mental illness before you really got recovery, you said that you had a rebellious spirit and that um, af uh, after your first breakdown at 29, you had years of homelessness where um, you lived on the beach, you lived with your dog, and and fields, shelter, um, tents, and um, you had some pretty horrendous experiences where and of a lot of loss, mm -hmm. you know, loss of, especially you told me loss of your family during that time. You lost your, your um, touch with your daughter and, um, and your wife and, and your family and, and um, your driving force and internal fight was to get back to your daughter. And um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, um, that you've been through so much, you know, from one point to where you are now. And. Um, but I couldn't have done it without the help of other people. Right. You know, I was. I had a successful background, and Larry Davidson calls it recovery capital. Where Larry you have, Davidson, you wanted to say who Larry Davidson is? Well, you, why don't you? you okay. Know him, you work for him. Yeah, he's, he runs a program called um, Yale Program for Community Health, and um, it's called PERCH. And he's, he's a wonderful advocate for people with mental health issues, and, mm -hmm. and he's been around for a long time, for about, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. really promoting um, value in people with ha who have mental illness. Around the world. Right. Yeah. yeah, he's amazing. So he came up with the idea, I think it was his idea, of recovery capital, meaning having some, some life events in your background that you can draw upon for strength, that you can build upon. And um, I had some of that from high school, uh, s successes in sports, and uh, my early work experiences. So I knew what it was to, what it's like to strive and look for results. And uh, so I had some of that. But a mental illness can rob you of the greatest desires that you've ever had and, and leave you weak need and, and even helpless. Right. And um, it, it can rob you of your hope entirely. And in key instances in my life, there were individuals who stepped in, and like Brian Gibbons, who held up a vision for me, like Cindy Carloni, who told me, why don't you work in the mental health field? And uh, when I thought that I could not 
do anything other than empty the garbage, which is nothing wrong with that. But <clears throat> I had over 40 jobs in my experience, and I had a college degree and a master's degree in counseling, and yet I was laboring in this social club, thinking that, as I was introduced to the club, thinking that I was uh, not, it wasn't possible for me to move ahead very far, very fast. Right. Well, I think it's really amazing that you were able to hold on to the people who did believe in you because it sounds like you have a very optimistic view of things. I mean, you're very, you held on to what, to the people that really believed in you and you didn't let, you never let go. You, you kept those. I guess that's why, why you call it recovery capital because you kind of kept it as something, um, for yourself to hold on to and to work toward, and, and, and you did, you know. They were shining lights for me. Right. They were examples of what I could be. Right. I, I can say similar things about myself, too, because um, there were a couple instances for me, like um, there was this therapist that I had in a, in a treatment program that I was in, and she, um, she knew that I was a writer, and um, once she came in and she gave me a brochure of a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing program at Smith College. And so she saw strengths in me. She believed in me when I never really went on to do that. I, had, I was going to, but I never did that. But um, I still write to this day and I, I love to write. And, but she saw my strengths. And mm -hmm. another thing was Larry Davidson again. You know, I, the first presentation I ever gave, he paid me $50 to give a presentation. And to me, he, that was his way of saying that he values me, you know, and my experiences and my mm -hmm. expertise on my recovery. And um, so all these people that we're mentioning are people with full of kindness and I'll say love as well. Right. You know, love was the motivation that really spurred me on and kept me fighting when I didn't feel like it. Love for my daughter, trying to get back to her. Um, that was the major, the major loss of my life. Um, so um, th those folks that we've talked about so far and others um, basically are showing love with their kindness. I mean, it's love for other people and, and um, it... Uh, really has pulled me out of some deep holes. Right. And do you think that like um, when you have people that believe in you, um, it, gives the, it gives you a, a real sense of self-esteem? Because I've found that um, there's some people that just want to knock you down and knock you over. And this isn't necessarily just people with mental illness. This is the world, you know, mm -hmm. where um, you know, peop some people just want to throw you aside and, you know, step all over you. And then there's some people that, you know, really you connect with, you have a mm -hmm. connection with. And have you found that? And, that, and that's where your self-esteem comes in because, um, because when someone believes in you and, and, and cares about you and accepts you, it, hel it, it helps your self-esteem a lot. It certainly does. The self-esteem that that you and I have won in such a hard way uh, was very fragile or non-existent at some point. Right, right. And mental illness in particular knocks the starch right out of you and in the absence of any education and uh, as well as the time to adapt to the idea that you have a mental illness, you're left with all the old stigmas. Um, and, and notions of mental illness that you, you should be ashamed, it's, it's, it's your fault, um, and that you're, you're, you're less than uh, acceptable to the world. And it's hard to come out of that hole without education and love and kindness. Right, right. And I was thinking of another thing, too. Um, someone once said, um, you don't have to understand me, you just have to accept me. And mm -hmm. I like that, too, because people may not understand what it's like to get inside the head of someone who has a mental illness, but they can accept and love that person just for who they are mm -hmm. and through their defects, through their weaknesses and their limitations. To see them as an individual. Right. 
And some people mm -hmm. are lucky, they have families that do accept them, mm -hmm. you know, but then there are other families that really stigmatize and they're afraid, they don't, they don't, they don't want to know about it, you know. Yeah, I had a family member um, who I won't designate who told friends that I fell off a motorcycle and hit my head and that's the reason I was um, behaving the way I was behaving. Mm -hmm. So they just... Um, they couldn't deal with the mental illness in the family. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's like, like you said, like a mark of shame or something, which yeah. it really shouldn't be at all. It, it's really an illness, you know, like diabetes or, mm -hmm. you know, um, and people need to know that. And they need to know, uh, if you haven't already touched upon it in previous shows, that people with mental illness are not really that violent caricature that the media portrays. Right, right. That the violence among people with mental illness is on a par with the regular population, accepting people who have a past history of violence before they're mentally ill and who may be on using drugs or, or alcohol. Mm -hmm. But that's true for the general population as well. Right, and I heard that um, one out of four people have a mental illness. Too. Sometime during their life. Sometime during their lifetime. So, yeah. um, now I want to ask you about some of the other things you did before you got to the point where you are now. But there's also a quote that you gave me, and I want to end with that quote. So I hope we have enough time. I think we have about five minutes, or or um, looks like um, maybe about five or six minutes. And um, so. Before you, you were a, a, a grievance rights person, what were some of the other things that you did? You were president of a, cl of a psychosocial club called Independence Center, and that's where you met Brian, right? Bri and well, Bri actually, my mom was a psychiatric nurse and worked with Brian and was very impressed with him and recommended that I give him a call and try to see him. He had a licensed clinical social worker and... Uh, so I spent some time with Brian, and I would do chores for him and help him out in different ways in exchange for therapy. Hmm, wow. So he was very helpful. Yeah. And then, so he, he saw that, and this was when you were the president of the club, and, and he wanted you to, so from there, from after you became president of the um social club, what happened after that? Where did you go from there? Well, actually, I was laboring in the club. Even though I was president, I was laboring in that club under the delusion that I would never go anywhere. Because mm -hmm. when I came into the club back in that time, they didn't believe in the strengths of people. They believed in the deficits. Mm -hmm. And when I came in, they told me they'd teach me how to comb my hair, brush my teeth, uh, wear clean clothes. Um, and maybe some days if I could do that, they would help me fill out a resume and I could apply for a job mopping the toilets. Right, right. I had 40 jobs under my belt and, a, as I said earlier, a college and a master's degree. Right. But because of their low expectations and my low self-esteem, I bought their message that I wasn't worth it. Right, right. But a guy came into the pool room one day and said, hey, uh, I got a job. And I said, how'd you get a job? And he mentioned this Cindy Carloni once again, who came to visit me at the club. And as I said earlier, uh, said, why don't you think about working in the mental health field instead right. of raking leaves right. with a bad back? So. so before that, you know, when they said at best you can get a job mopping the floor, I mean, that does something to your dignity mm -hmm. as a person because, um, because, because you have so much going for you. you and um, to, to belittle that and demean it like that, you know, is just terrible and inexcusable, you know, the way they treat mm -hmm. people who have so much potential and a good mind and mm -hmm. a future. And um, you can tend to believe that. And do you, do you feel like you, did believe that for a long time and it affected your self-esteem? Absolutely. I internalized their messages for me. Mm -hmm. And the absence of any messages of hope and encouragement mm -hmm. and given my own crushing fall with the mental illness, uh, 
I was left to believe that there wasn't much for me out there. Right, right. Well, then along the way, um, now you told me that there was someone named Dan Collins, too. Well, Cindy Carloni introduced me to Dan Collins, who ran a social, a, um, excuse me, a uh, group home. Okay. And I met Dan, and I said, I don't know if I can do this. And he said, well, neither do I, but why don't we give it a try? And so I um, made awkward motion through the club doing groups, and one thing led to another, and I ended up working as a, as a residential counselor for St. Vincent de Paul in Waterbury, and then for other places in Waterbury, self-incorporated, and eventually uh, landed a job with the state. Mm -hmm. Great. One thing led to another. That's, that's really a, a big step to get a job with the state. Yeah. But um, backing up, when I was uh, in Fairfield Hills Mental Hospital, I got out of there. I was a worker there first, mm -hmm. and then a client, which was hard to take. Oh, yeah. But yeah. then um, uh, I went to this uh, hospital in Waterbury, and I was there for two and a half years on and off. And when I discharged myself against medical advice, they told me the best you could do is unload trucks for a living if you're supervised. So mm -hmm. I went to graduate school instead. <laughs> you got even with them. <laughs> um, so now you you also say that you've been the chair. You're the chair of a regional board and six committees. Is that what you're doing now, or you did have did do One that? One time there was another lady named Janine Sullivan Wiley who believed in me, and she suggested I become the chairperson of the Northwest Regional Mental Health Board. Mm. And hesitatingly and tremblingly, I took that step and did well enough that they extended the bylaws so that I could serve three terms instead of two. Wow. And I've been on a lot of different committees over the years, and I owe a lot of that to Janine's faith in me. So people really believed in you when you didn't believe in yourself that much because yeah. other people have been giving you these messages. And that's what I try to do for other people now is try to instill that vision and hope in them. Right. And I think there's some results showing from that. It, one person helps one person, then they help another, and it kind of goes on. Right, right. Well, let me finish up. We don't have too much time left. We only have a couple minutes. But you said something that I, I want you to um, um, explain to the people. Um, you said that, that there are fruits of the Spirit uh, in people that, that many people manifest. No, I don't think I got that That's right. That's close but. enough, yeah. <laughs> I think that the people I work for with and privileged to serve, i.e. those who have mental illness, um, manifest the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, Corinthians in the Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit more beautifully than I can ever recollect. But there are things like uh, long-suffering, patience, kindness, love, charity. Um, uh, I don't know if I said kindness, which is the theme of the show. Right. Um, and uh, people who have been hurt a lot um, oftentimes are very graceful and when they come out um, the other end. And I see that all the time in my work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It gives them a humility and, and a gratitude. gratitude. I found that um, gratitude is very important in my life. Mm. That probably didn't have it before I, I had started having issues, but now I have a lot of gratitude for every day, you know, little things that, that mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for to be alive. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people just take that for granted and, you know, just take one day and let it turn into another and another and another and just you know don't appreciate mm -hmm. the, the amazing things in life and it's a miracle know. yeah it is it's it's a miracle that you're a miracle and and I am a miracle that we're here talking to each other and mm -hmm. um, you know and not in chains like they used to be and we're uh, locked in a in a hospital the rest of your life or mm -hmm. freedom is something that's very very important mm -hmm. to have the freedom to, to choose how we want to live our life and it sounds like you chose 
the right people to hook into that helped you rise from from one step to the next to the next to the next mm -hmm. you know and and that's that's an insight that a lot of people don't have mm -hmm. which is really um great you know there's a lot of grace involved not on my part but um but 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 for grace i might not have met these people um they put themselves out, not only to me, but to many other people, and I was one of the lucky ones who bumped into them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of believe that maybe they were put there for a purpose to kind of almost like type of guardian angel, or mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into spirituality that much, but I do believe that there's some people that come into our lives for a reason to help us to grow spiritually mm -hmm. or emotionally or... Yeah, evidently they do. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, it looks like we're, we only have a couple minutes left. So I just wanted to, um, you know, just mention something about kindness again. That mm -hmm. that um, kindness can transform a person's life. It's very underrated, and people don't talk about it that much. But people need that. People need to be shown that you know, that they're, that they have gifts and strengths and, and um, that they're lovable. You know, a lot of people that we know in the field never felt like they were lovable or acceptable. Mm -hmm. And you felt that, did you feel that way about some of the clients that you work with? That Sure. P people who have, um, all kinds of people, but people with mental illness have had almost universally tremendous trauma in their lives and they've been beat up in uh, many different ways sexually physically psychologically emotionally and they come into our system and look for care from us and if they don't receive kindness they don't grow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to that's why I call it the fountainhead of recovery the place where rivers form and start Recovery starts with kindness, I believe. Right, right. Well, um, I just want to thank you very much, Brian, for coming on the show. Thanks, Vicki. I think it you had a lot of right. very profound um, issues to talk about. And um, I think kindness is always important all the time to be kind and compassionate. So um, I just want to thank you for coming, and and I want to thank Josh for doing the production, and and I want to thank Madison TV to you, us to use the studio, and um, so I I hope you enjoyed the show, and we're going to have another show next month. We we air once a month, and I, I also have um, a list of support groups next month to give you. I'll give you names of people who, who have, are contacts for these support groups because I've gotten a couple of calls from people who are looking for support groups. So next month I'll give you the names of these contact people that you, and these are support groups all over the state. So um, just want to let you know that and, I, and have a good night.